Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we are free by your grace that you have poured out on us. We are free from the entanglements of sin. And Lord, we stand here before you with these glorious promises through your son Jesus Christ, through the death on the cross and being raised again on the third day, our sins have been washed away and we are new creatures in Jesus. We are free and we praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have done such an amazing and mighty work in our lives and in the lives of all those around us. So come, be with us now in these next moments. Be glorified as we revel in your greatness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a joy it is to be with you. The start of another school year is always an exciting thing, but this is particularly exciting for me. This is, as Dean Tab mentioned, uh, our 10th year celebration. It's going to last pretty much all year. Uh, and so we're going to enjoy this for a long time, and rightly so. The fact that this school even exists is only because of the grace of God. It is only because of his mercy in creating this school and supplying our every need. So we are glad that you are here. We're glad to be able to come together as a body of Christ, as Bethlehem College and Seminary, to celebrate and worship our great God. It's our hope and prayer that chapel will become a central feature of your experience here. That we want chapel to be a time when we come together to go hard after God. That this isn't just another thing on your schedule that you have to cross off that, okay, I've done that. We want you to come every week linking together with fellow heirs to be able to lift our voices to God and to be inspired and uplifted by the word of God being faithfully proclaimed from this podium. So we look forward to encouraging one another. Life will get hard. If it isn't already, it will get hard. And so we need to link arms and to encourage one another as long as it's today to persevere in the faith, to grow in our faith, to become more and more like Jesus every single day so that when we reach the end of our journey, we will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. That's what I want to hear. When the Lord calls me home, that's what I want to hear. Now, I'd like to ask if you are a new student this fall, that is, this is your first time as a student at Bethlehem College and Seminary, would you please stand up? Welcome all of you to our family. We are so glad that you are here and we firmly believe, as I hope you do too, that you are not here by accident. You are here by God's providential design. That is, he has led you here and we have prayed hard with you as you have made the decision that brought you here. And we continue to pray for you that God will use your experience here in a profound way in your life as he prepares you for a life of ministry. Now the place of chapel particularly is a, a specific um, place in where we come together as I said, to worship God and to proclaim the word of God. We are a word-centered institution. If you hadn't noticed already, you will soon notice. That's our focus, is that we want all of you to know and cherish and be able to understand the word of God deeply. But it's also a time when we come together as an entire institution, college and seminary, faculty and staff, as well as visitors who come and are welcome every week to join us for worship and for the word. And so we encourage you to be on the lookout when you're here for people you don't know or people that you don't recognize. Don't just come and sit with your friends all the time, although that's a nice thing to do, but also be on the lookout for people who you don't know yet and seek out opportunities 
to get to know people, to pray for them, and to encourage them in their faith. And chapel is a central part of our experience as a result of what we do here. Now, as the first chapel of the year, we also have uh, an occurrence that we do every year, which is asking our faculty to um, commit to the vows that they have made to serve you well. We also usually announce any faculty promotions that have occurred over the summer and that we have one to announce in that regard this uh, chapel service. So we have criteria that all of our faculty have to meet in order to rise in rank from instructor to assistant professor to associate professor and ultimately to full professor. So those are the four ranks that we incorporate in our faculty hierarchy. And it's a combination of longevity and a combination of academic accomplishment in terms of degrees, as well as other services, whether it's uh, scholarly productivity or engaging in significant activity that aids the school or aids the church. And we look at all of those things together in order to make the determination when someone is worthy of being advanced in rank. And so we have one professor who has received such recognition, and so I would like to ask Mr. Lance Kramer to stand. <laughs> professor Kramer, thank you. <laughs> professor Kramer is being promoted from instructor to assistant professor this year, and it's an honor well-deserved. Uh, for those of you who maybe don't know, uh, Professor Kramer was really the spearhead of our latest accreditation efforts, and so he has put in a tremendous amount of work over the last two years leading our efforts to become reaccredited as an institution, and that is no small task, I can assure you. And uh, so not only is Professor Kramer an outstanding professor and teacher, but he has performed an excellent service for the college, and we are grateful to you. So thank you and congratulations, Lance. <laughs> now I'd like to ask all of our faculty to please stand wherever you are, please stand. The faculty of Bethlehem College and Seminary have all made a public commitment to our faculty vows. These vows are an important marker before God and all of us of the solemn responsibility that they have as teachers. Therefore, we will ask all of them now to reaffirm their commitment to these vows. By affirming your following vows, you are making before God and everyone present here a public declaration of your intention to abide by them in your role as a faculty member of Bethlehem College and Seminary. After you hear each vow read, please affirm it by saying, I do with God's help. As one who by grace has come to embrace Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and supreme treasure of your life, do you solemnly and gladly pledge to live under the authority of God's inerrant word and, as a dependent creature, do you affirm your fundamental reliance on God's grace to live out these commitments? I do, with God's help. Do you joyfully embrace and affirm without reservation the Bethlehem College and Seminary affirmation of faith and pledge to conform your life and instruction to it? As one particularly engaged in the life of the mind, do you commit yourself to the highest standards of integrity, honesty, and academic rigor, wholeheartedly affirming the Lordship of Christ over all of life and thought? I do, with God's help. Do you recognize that your calling as a Christian educator is a privilege and solemn responsibility, and acknowledge that God will judge more strictly those whom he has called to teach Moreover, do you pledge to pursue biblical excellence both in your academic scholarship and in your classroom instruction, always seeking that which edifies the church, advances the kingdom, and displays the glory of Christ? I do, with God's help. 
Do you pledge to pursue glad-hearted obedience to Christ in all areas of your life, to faithfully attend and support the ministry of the local church, and to seek to walk wisely and faithfully in the world, knowing that you represent the Lord Jesus Christ and this institution before the local community, academic community, and the wider world? Do you pledge to take the lead in cultivating a learning environment marked by radical Christ-centeredness, academic rigor, personal holiness, and self-effacing humility? Moreover, as a Christian educator, do you recognize that your aim with respect to your students is to instruct their minds, awaken their affections, and shape their lives such that they also seek to glorify God in whatever they do? May the Lord guide you and bless you as you fulfill these commitments to our students and to our school. Thank you. Now, before we launch into our introduction to the book of Colossians, I want to pray for our faculty specifically. As the vows they have taken, they take seriously. And those are weighty responsibilities that they are undertaking willingly. Father, I do pray for our faculty. You have said that let not many of you become teachers because as such we will incur a stricter judgment. That's how seriously you take, Lord, the role of teaching and how seriously you take truth. And so I pray, Father, for our faculty as they embark on their teaching and helping our students to learn more and more about you, more and more about your word, and more and more about your world. Lord, would you strengthen them? Would you encourage them? Would you give them great wisdom and discernment? Would you help them, Lord, to direct our students rightly, to lead them, Lord, to discover new beauties, new glories about you? And I pray, Father, that, that as we go through this together as fellow heirs, and fellow sojourners on the path of sanctification, we pray, Lord, that we would help each other along the way in all the ways that you equip us to do that. So I thank you, Lord, for these faculty members and pray that your blessings on them, that they would derive great satisfaction from the calling that they are fulfilling here. And Lord, that you would allow them the privilege of seeing you at work in powerful and mighty ways in and among our students and in their classes. So, Lord, bless them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Dr. Tab said, we are going to be focusing on the book of Colossians this fall semester in our chapel series. And when we deliberated about that earlier in the year, this was something that was near and dear to my heart as well as, I think, a really key time for us to be going back to, in a sense, our roots. Um, So much of what makes Bethlehem College and Seminary what it is, is because of our understanding of the centrality and supremacy and preeminence of Jesus Christ over all things. And no book probably captures that as well as the book of Colossians. And so for us to spend a semester focusing on this great letter is, I believe, going to serve us well and to encourage all of us. We are celebrating our 10th anniversary as a degree-granting institution. And I hear those words coming out of my lips and I can hardly believe it. It still seems like we're just getting started. And maybe in some sense we are, but nevertheless, God has granted us 10 years of history so far and we are eager to see what he is going to do in the years to come as well. But Colossians, why Colossians? Why has that played such a key role? Well, I've already given you a hint. Because we see it as so essential to the mission of what we do to keep Christ supreme over all things. And I'm sure most of you, especially those of you who are new students, you have, were probably inundated with literature from other institutions as you were making your college choices and you probably read a lot of verbiage in those sorts of literatures that would describe the institutions 
as Christ-centered. So everyone talks about being Christ-centered. All I know is we want to be Christ-centered, not just talk about it. We want this to be our identity, that what we are pursuing together as faculty, staff, and students is we are pursuing making much of Jesus Christ. We want to make much of him because he is the center of the universe. I don't get to preach on this text, but the the text that's coming up in two weeks will illustrate that beautifully, that Jesus Christ holds all things together. He's created all things. All things exist for him and through him. You can't get any more central to all of life and existence than that. And so we want to, together, make much of Jesus because he is over all things and he has secured our redemption. He has freed us from our sins so that we will be with him in heaven one day by his grace. Now, as you look at this particular letter by Paul, one of the occasions that caused Paul to write this letter is that there was false teaching that was creeping into the church at Colossae, which is true for almost all the churches that Paul planted. And so if there are any church planters or aspiring church planters among us, it's not a matter of if false teaching will show up at your door at some point, it's when will it show up and how will you deal with it? That's the question. And that's true for any of us as individuals too. It's not just churches that have to deal with false teaching. We have to deal with false teaching as well. And so the only way to deal accurately with false teaching is to know the truth and to know it so well we can spot false teaching a mile away. And so that's what Paul is doing in this letter. In every age, including Paul's, the dangers of false gospels and false teachings are ever present. In every generation, Satan's design is to distract dissuade or to deceive Christians and non-Christians alike to believe lies rather than truth. And the lies that are so often believed look like truth. They're camouflaged so that they are believable in some way or at some level. And so therefore, it's harder for us detecting them because they, they kind of sound like they could be true. And so therefore, it really requires us as believers and requires us as churches to be on guard against false teaching at all times. And that's why it's so important to have the anchor of God's word. And that's why we emphasize God's word at this school, because we need to know it. We need to know it backwards and forwards so that we can measure all ideas against it in order to discern false teaching We emphasize, as you either know or will know soon, we emphasize studying the Bible in the original languages. And so whether you're a seminary student or a college student, we are praying that God will equip you to be able to understand the original languages well enough that you can read them and interpret them in the languages in which they were written. We view theology as the covering discipline over all other disciplines of study. Theology is the baseline against which we measure and evaluate all ideas. So understanding and knowing what the Bible teaches becomes our basis for being able to evaluate all other ideas. And one of the things that is so essential, I think, is that like in the book of Colossians or the letter uh, that Paul wrote to the Colossians is to be able to know the truth, evaluate ideas that are being put forth in a probably a compelling way and to be able to glean from those ideas the things that are right and that are worthy and then to discard everything that is contrary to what God teaches. And so that, that takes some real skill and that takes practice. And it's our hope that by the time you leave this institution, you will be very good at doing that. The importance of living our lives in such a way as to please God is also one of the focuses of the book of Colossians. So knowing the truth is a key component. And then how do you apply that truth? How do you live in such a way as to bring honor and glory to God? 
because it does matter how we live our lives. Some of the false teachings that appeared in many of the churches that Paul planted was that you didn't really have to worry about how you lived your life on a day-to-day basis because of God's grace. God's grace was sufficient to cover all your sins, therefore you should sin so that grace may abound, right? Isn't that what Paul, no, no, that's right. Paul didn't say that. He said, no, we should not sin so that grace abounds. Rather, we must pay great attention to how we live our lives so that we would be pleasing to God. Walking in a manner worthy of God and being fully pleasing to Him, all within the context of putting on love as our attitude of how we go about living our life. So this theme, the centrality, the sufficiency, the preeminence of Jesus Christ is consistent through the whole institution. We had two weeks ago, we had our annual fall faculty planning days and so we gathered together for two days to prepare ourselves for the coming year. And I put forward a message there emphasizing that we want to pay great attention to the sufficiency, the supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus Christ across all of our classes, across all of our activities that we do. Everything that we do, we wish to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. And so, hopefully, God will allow you to see that as we go through the year, that you will sense that, that that is our focus because it is essential to our faith. Now, let's talk about the context of this particular letter that Paul wrote. This is a church, interestingly, that was started through a conversion uh, story. In other words, Paul never was, as far as we know, in Colossae. That is, this was not a a city where he went and preached the gospel and then moved on and, and started preaching somewhere else. Apparently, or at least we don't know, whether or not he ever went to this city. What we do know, though, is that Epaphras, who was from Colossae, heard Paul preaching, probably in Ephesus, and he was converted, became a believer, went back to his hometown, and started sharing the gospel with his friends and neighbors there, and a church was started. And so this church in Colossae is as a result of an evangelistic outreach that Paul had in some other city, and Here is the fruit being born. So like so many of these churches, false teaching began to appear, and Paul then wrote a letter as he heard the reports of this false teaching, and he wrote a letter back to this church that he had never visited in order to encourage them in their faith and to help them to withstand this teaching. So it's meant to do two things, strengthen their faith, correct the false teaching. So what is the false teaching? In the book of Colossians. Difficult to know with certainty. There have been different theories that have been put forth over the years. Most of them have not stuck. And so all we can say for sure is that it apparently was promoting some sort of mysticism, fascination with angels, and, and other sorts of kind of ritualistic um, activities, all of which were taking the place of Christ. So it was de-emphasizing Jesus, whatever this false teaching was, it was de-emphasizing the importance of Jesus Christ and putting importance on other things. And so as Paul writes this letter then, he reiterates the gospel of grace and he admonishes the church to live in such a way as to please the Lord. And the one thing you can't help but noticing as you read the book of Colossians is how Paul lovingly cares for this young church. I mean, this is a beautiful thing to behold, how Paul, from a distance, is caring for this young church. He is filled with thanksgiving to the Lord for them. It's the opening portion that we're gonna look at in a minute. He's committed to praying for them, which he says he does regularly, and he even does right in the letter he prays for them and he focuses on the truth with them, so he helps them to understand what's true and what's false. So now let's look at Colossians chapter one, 
verses one through eight. And this is really gonna be more of a meditation and some observations. Given the amount of time that we have, it will go fast. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So the first thing we notice is Paul's salutation, of course. And in the salutation, Paul is firmly establishing his authority as an apostle. He doesn't always use that title in all of his letters. Sometimes he does but not always, but this time he is using it because he wants to establish his authority. Since he's never been there, they've not met him face to face, he is proclaiming that authority. And his authority, however, is not self-given, but rather, as it says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So the authority as an apostle is given to him by God, not by himself. And so he is the one who has the authority to speak to the issues of false teaching and correcting those things. The risen, glorified Christ spoke directly to Paul. He spoke to him on the Damascus Road, and that's how Paul moved from being Saul to Paul, is because God met him in a very dramatic and powerful way, showing him his true nature. And then, And this is less clear, but Paul also received direct instruction from Jesus Christ because it says in Galatians 1, 11 to 12 that I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a three-year window from the time that Paul has the Damascus Road experience and the time when he goes to Jerusalem. And so it's apparently during that three-year window where Jesus revealed to him the gospel and taught him personally. And that's how he had what he had to be able to write all these letters that are so central to our faith. So who is the letter written to? It's not written to the false teachers, it's written only to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a letter of encouragement, it's a letter of instruction, and it's a commendation. Paul is commending the Colossian believers for their faith. He's commending them for how they have conducted themselves as a young church. Moving to verse three, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So Paul is a praying missionary. He prays for churches, he prays for individuals, and he does so faithfully. And I just think so many of these lessons that we can learn from the Apostle Paul are hard, praying is not, at least it shouldn't be praying for others, praying for churches, praying for missionaries is something every single one of us can do and should do faithfully day by day by day. Because who knows what impact our prayers will have on the work and the ministry and the lives of those around us. So Paul routinely prays for the churches that he's planted or spawned and gives prayers of thanks to God for them But why is Paul thankful to God for the church at Colossae? He's thankful to God, he says in this verse, he says, I'm thankful to God since we have heard of your faith. So he's really grateful to God that these people are faithful, 
that they have faith in God, they're trusting God for their eternal life, and because of their love for the saints. So however they were expressing it, the saints at Colossae were demonstrating their faith in Christ by loving the body of Christ around them. And then he goes on to say, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So faith and love are motivated by the hope that these dear Christians have for believing in the promises of God. And this is a hope that's not wishful thinking. This is a hope that's built on the rock-solid promises of God. They are hoping in the resurrection, their resurrection. They know that Jesus was resurrected, and they're hoping in their own resurrection. They're hoping in eternal life, the promise of eternal life, and they're hoping in the prospect of being with Jesus in paradise one day, that God will see them through to the end. Faith, hope, and love then are intertwined in the true believer's life. We talk a lot about faith. We talk a lot about love. Don't talk quite as much necessarily about hope, but all three of them are inseparable. If you think you have one, but you don't really think you have the other two, you need to reexamine your life because the mark of a Christian, the marks of a Christian are all three of those attributes, faith, hope, and love. And that's what Paul is exhorting these believers to have. Now, the coming weeks are going to be rich and full and deep. We're going to have uh, Pastor Meyer who's going to be speaking next week, and then Chancellor Piper will be speaking the week after that as we get into the meat of this letter. And I can't wait to hear more of the centrality and supremacy of Christ as we do these things. So I want to conclude our chapel time now with another prayer. So I want us to bathe these things in prayer. And if you are one of the students who stood up previously, I'm going to ask you to stand up again. Any of the new students, well, all of the new students, please stand up. Don't be shy. And now I'd want all of those who are returning students and faculty and staff, would you Turn to one of the new students, put your hand out toward them or put your hand on them. So we want to pray for a blessing from the Lord to them as they begin their studies among us. Father, I thank you. Not one person is in this room by accident. By your providence, by your will, you have brought them all here for your purposes. And I pray now, Lord, that Satan would be thwarted, that he would not be able to discourage them, that he would not be able to cause them to stumble in any way, but Lord, that you would fill them with your spirit, that you would give them, Lord, what they need to not only survive, but to thrive in their studies here and in their relationships that they'll be forming and in the ministries that they will engage in at the church. So Father, I pray for your richest, deepest blessings on them. And Lord, for the rest of us who are returning, I pray that you would grant us fullness of Christ, that you would grant us joy beyond measure as we seek to know you more and to serve you with all our might. Lord, be with us. Bless us as we work together, striving together, Lord, to encourage one another to the finish line, to equip each other to be agents of gospel grace and evangelistic zeal as we seek to spread your fame throughout the earth. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.